Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how. And, I, you know, I'm not going to be so presumptuous as to um, try to give you a rule book, but I'm going to try to give you some principles. First of all, you know, you see this a lot in jazz and uh, improvised music, but also in innovation processes all, all around, which is that the key skill is being able to balance tensions and opposites. And you got a little bit of this actually with some of the pictures that were these puzzle pictures where it could be a man or a woman or a, you know, a goat or a bird or whatever. You know, keeping two things in mind at the same time and finding this, what jazz musicians call the sweet spot uh, is a very important mental attitude that is um, uh, fundamental to being a successful uh, manager of, of innovation. Um, so the way I, I sometimes like to describe it is, you know, we could have the sheet music. If you remember, it's very structured, right? I, maybe you forgot. <laughs> anyway, that, right? No, no uh, variation, all structure. But, you know, a lot of people think innovation is about giving people permission to do whatever they want. Um, this is what playing whatever you want sounds like. So, you know, it's very creative, but it's, you know, I wouldn't pay money for that CD, right? So it's almost like you're, you know, you have two opposites, one of which is the structure, one of which is the, the random white noise, right? This picture, in the middle of which, right, is jazz improvisation. So think about how it works in terms of the innovation processes that you're familiar with. You know, how do you balance top down, which is the boss setting a framework, versus bottom up, people coming up with ideas? How do you balance the core versus the edge? How do you balance the plan versus something that just comes up and emerges? How do you balance the expert versus everybody? How do you balance the noble past that you have to bow your head to versus possibilities that are not proven? How do you balance concrete evidence versus your intuition? How do you balance improvement-oriented innovation versus disruptive innovation? I mean, these are the hard judgment calls that have to be made every day by successful managers of innovation. And if you're not tuned into these, then you may not be managing uh, for exactly the, the right things. So again, you know, I'm not so presumptuous as to give you a rule book, but I am going to, if I were sitting down with you individually and you were saying, well, I'm thinking about starting an innovation campaign or we've been doing an innovation campaign and we're not so happy about it, which are the two main reasons why people tend to call me up, um, I would be asking these questions of you. So let me ask these questions of you uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group, as an audience, right? So the first question is, do you have a vision of the future that defines the purpose of innovation and where you want it to go? And vision, you know, is kind of this tired out management word, but it's very important in the sense that the more vivid you can create a picture of the future that you want, the more likely it is you're going to achieve it, right? And innovation is really an answer to that question. Innovation is always an answer to a question. Innovation by itself, who cares? But innovation as an answer to a question that you really care about, fundamentally important. That question that you care about is in turn defined by your vision, which is nothing more or less than the picture of your desired future, what you want. Okay. I've got 14 of these. The second is, do you have a story that defines this sense of purpose, right? So it's not enough to just kind of have the vision. Most organizations, if they have a vision, are really not so good at telling a story that motivates people. Right? What's the narrative? What's the story? You know, I like to joke that, you know, nobody joined the French Revolution because they got a memo. Right? I mean, they were in the grip of a powerful story, and the story was motivating. Stories also create urgency. You know, if you don't have urgency, you won't have a desire to change. Because why change? If there's no reason, you know, no, 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 if there's no problem, why would you alter your behavior? You might say you will, but you won't. It's like saying, uh, well, I don't need to lose weight, you know. <laughs> you know, there's no urgency. And then, of course, you have your first heart attack. Maybe you have to have, to have your second heart attack, you know, and then you'll say, oh, well, I better take that pretty seriously. So how does the narrative kind of inform your sense of urgency? You know, my, my former colleague, John Cotter, who's written a book on urgency, says if 60% of the people in your organization don't feel a sense of urgency in your gut, it's going to be very hard to shift the direction of the organization. So how you tell the story becomes really, really important. 
Three, do you have ways of finding the new? I mean, once you've kind of redefined the perception, that's fine, but how do you, how do you redefine reality, all right? So there's this wonderful quote from uh, a composer, uh, Anton Webern, uh, about modulation. Modulation is how you change keys in music. And he says, I go out into the hall to knock in a nail. On my way there, I decide I would rather go out. I obey the impulse, get into a train, come to a railway station, go on traveling, and finally end up in America, right? So it's as if you're, you know, doing something in uh, the key of F, right? And, you know, we're all... But instead of, you know, proceeding in that line, you go... And all of a sudden, you've asserted a new standard. That's modulation, right? So how do you modulate in an organization when you have the pressures of legacy and doing things in a standard kind of way? I mean, how do you step out? What are the ways for you to find what is new? And this could be the subject of a, an entire talk unto itself, but there are, there are a lot of rules of thumb. I mean, I wouldn't, again, don't etch these in stone, but these are just thoughts about how you could do it. You know, get out of the office, take a look at what's going on. You know, you talked about, Michael talked about small packaging, okay? So I live in San Francisco, which is like an experimentation city. There is a store called Small down the block from me that was just opened by an architectural design firm. It's all small food. It is a laboratory for packaging. If I were a Tetra Pak person, I would be going to small tomorrow and talking to the owners who, by the way, are looking for financing. And I would say, can we just buy your company and use it as a lab? Uh, and we want to just observe consumer behavior because, you know, people in San Francisco are kind of like vanguard consumers, right? So you got to get out of the office to find that kind of stuff, right? How do you take the risk out of experimentation? How do you go somewhere like to a skunk works that is free of the corporate mainstream? How do you fund things that are outside of your you know, core plans? How do you get intimate with customers, which is the font of new things? How do you maintain awareness of what's going on in your environment? How do you limber up intuition and just say, well, I think there's something we should do. I can't prove it. My gut says we should do it. Um, how do you practice good brainstorming? Uh, how do you hire people who are different from you? You know, Sergio Zeman, who was the head of Coca-Cola for a while, I interviewed him for uh, jamming, and he, uh, he had just hired 200 marketing executives as the new guy, you know, cutting off the heads of all the old ones and bringing in a whole bunch of new ones. And the only criterion for the new ones was that none of them could have any experience in the beverage industry. So they all had to be outsiders. Pretty interesting, right? Pretty gutsy. Um, working with outsiders. Crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, also modalities for finding the new. Okay. Um, have you defined focal practices for innovation that work for you? Now, this is what I said in the beginning, right? It's a capability. And, you know, the point is, it's not necessarily the specifics. I couldn't say to each one of you right at this moment, you should do this or you should do that. But here's a menu, you know, it could be design thinking, right? So what, what about design thinking becomes really useful? Customer insight, acting like a venture capitalist, prototyping. Uh, relationship and alliance building, enabling an ecosystem around your firm, creating a physical environment for innovation, hiring for talent, so HR policy, strategic foresight, process knowledge, organizational learning. I mean, all of these are uh, capabilities that you can invest in. And if you put your 10,000, you know, 10,000 hours is what my, Malcolm Gladwell said was what you needed to do to become a master of something. So if you played the cello for 10,000 hours, chances are you'd either drop out before 10,000 hours or you'd become really, really good. This is the, these are focal skills that invite the development of competence, right? Five, do you have a way for disruptive innovation to co-evolve with the day-to-day? -day? I mean, this is a tension in every organization. We have the today organization, but we have to figure out how to invest in tomorrow. So this is a picture of a skunk for the Skunk Works, which was Lockheed's approach to designing visionary aircraft. They basically took this guy, Kelly Johnson, in the 1930s, and they said, you're the head of the new experimental division. Here's money. Goodbye. And he left, he moved somewhere else, and you know, w there's now a tradition of new projects. You know, the IBM uh, personal computer, they, they talked to Phil Estridge, they said, here's money, goodbye. And he went to Florida and set up a whole new company, right? Um, so, um, do you have that way? And it's not just saying it. 
I mean, if you say, oh yes, we believe in disruptive innovation, we are risk takers, you know, words mean nothing. Infrastructure, investment, doing stuff means everything, right? So what are you gonna do about it? All right, do your learning processes fit with the culture and style of today, right? So here's the old style white collar factory. This is also the way, you know, traditional schools operate. This is the hackathon, lean startup, uh, jam session uh, setting in which a lot of learning about entrepreneurship occurs. And this is peer learning, it's uh, interactive, it's improvisational, and it's sort of like jazz. You know, in the old days, in New York in the 50s, there was this very famous jazz club called Minton's uh, Place, and after the jazz musicians did their gig, their, their engagement, they would go down here and they would just have informal jam, jam sessions, which were also called cutting sessions. The, as in, I'm gonna cut you off at the knees because I'm gonna be so much better than you that you're gonna go back and practice your scales, right? And this is, you know, so Mulgrew Miller, who's a very famous jazz pianist, he said this, he said, they learn by being on the bandstand and getting their rear ends kicked and being embarrassed and going home and just trying to figure it all out, which in a way is what this, you know, whole hackathon culture is all about. You put your ideas out in public, shared as quickly as possible, get as much feedback as possible, and then you move on, right? That's Minton's Jazz Club. All right, where do you sit within this global, global equation? Um, so this is a, um, a chart that I made a few years ago where the size of the country is proportional to the innovation capability of that country. This is quite a controversial uh, figure in its day, which I'm very happy about. Um, and so, you know, what you see is there are a lot of countries that are in the innovation game now, and little countries like Finland and Singapore and so on can be big players in the global innovation marketplace. And, you know, I had been asked to talk a little bit about innovation nation, you know, although I, I sense that your interests lay more in kind of what do I do in my company. But, you know, here we have the U.S., which arguably is still the preeminent innovation nation, right? which at the same time is having challenges with funding, with uh, public education, uh, fostering the careers of young scientists, fiscal policy around innovation, uh, coordination of federal and state and local, absence of a national strategy for innovation, much as the administration would say they have one, and so forth and so on. So the stage is set for a long-term deterioration of the enabling conditions for innovation in America, while at the same time, any entrepreneur worth their salt, whether they're from Herzliya, Israel, or you know, uh, Mumbai, wants to get to Silicon Valley, wants uh, our kind of uh, early stage risk capital, wants the culture of risk taking and freedom and so forth and so on. So every country has its version of an innovation nation dilemma, right? And at the same time, the investment that's going on globally is breathtaking. So Singapore has poured billions of dollars into being a global powerhouse in life sciences. And Singapore, you know, with uh, four plus million people, no natural resources, no reason to think they should be a global powerhouse in life sciences, invested in what they call the Singapore Biopolis. And uh, now, now they're big players, right? So uh, Skokovo Foundation, right? They're building uh, a massive um, city that's going to house, they think, 30,000 knowledge workers to drive Russia's innovation strategy. You know, I say good luck. Um, and does anybody know what this is? This is the new Apple computer headquarters. That's all lined in Gorilla Glass, so all curved glass. Um, it's designed on the same principles that Steve Jobs designed the Pixar headquarters, maximum interaction, open spaces, and so forth and so on. So these are kind of like the jazz clubs for innovation. These are the physical environments that encourage accidental encounters, uh, uh, spontaneous interaction, uh, where uh, the creation of knowledge is actually supported by the building itself. Okay, number eight. Do you have an ability to take an appropriate level of risk? Right? This is very important. You know, in most countries that say they embrace risk and tolerate failure and uncertainty, it just is not true. Um, uh, so here, here's the best little video about risk taking that I've been able to find. This is Michael Jordan, of course. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. I've lost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. 
I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So, can't say it any better than that. Um, do you have a process for clarifying weak signals and emerging agendas from the environment? I mean, most people that I know in uh, senior positions in major companies have a real challenge to try to stay in touch with what's going on outside of their immediate uh, field of vision. So the, this guy here, I don't know if you have a guess as to what he's doing. Kind of weird. So he's actually, this is the way in the old days you would listen for these, right? All right, so this, listening for this, okay. 10, are your innovation processes fast, smart, and agile enough? Uh, this is a sad uh, or, or organizational chart which is all of the U.S. Uh, government agencies responsible for Homeland Security on September 10th, uh, 2001, right? So you could not imagine any meetings or collaboration with a situation of this complexity. And often, this is what it looks like with innovation in companies or countries. There's just a lot of stakeholders and a lot of chaos. So what, what are the organizational processes? Do you have the resources? For innovation, you know, so you can talk about it and say it's really important, but show me the money, show me the ability to free people so they have time, show me the white space, right, and show me that it's balanced with the requirements of the today business, right. So there is this challenge. It's another sweet spot issue of how much do you allocate to today versus tomorrow. And maybe we'll talk about that in the discussion. Uh, Number 12, do you have an effective model for innovation stewardship? So if there's another thing that I would recommend you think about as you ponder this talk, it's who's responsible and what are their authorities, what's their mandate for actually making innovation happen? If you don't have responsibility allocated, you won't get an innovation uh, uh, initiative or agenda. So here's how I look at what I call stewardship. I don't like the word governance because it implies that somebody is in control of it, right? So stewardship. Who takes care of it? So the top level, clearly, you know, you got a CEO, you got a board, you got a head of state if it's a government, and they're responsible for uh, crafting the vision, the story, um, providing resources. You know, it's a lot of the stuff that we talked about earlier as being important. If you don't have this, it's very hard to get a comprehensive innovation agenda going, right? But you also need all of us, right? So Michael talked about it has to be all of, you know, it has to embrace everyone in the organization. By the way, I think that that's true a lot of the time, but I also think there are times when you have to focus on certain groups within the organization, so there's kind of a horizontal and a vertical dimension that's a big story unto itself. But the bottom up, all of us, you know, do the ideas bubble up? And then there's what you call, I would call the middleware. You know, the people who own agendas, who are frontline managers, who are, in a sense, the ones who will be responsible for making the uh, innovation strategy come alive, right? And so the question is, who are they? What, what's their resourcing? What are their authorities? You know, what are the understandings about who communicates with whom? What information is shared? What the expectations are, the metrics? And again, there is no rule book for doing this. I'm giving you parameters, and I'm suggesting that if you do nothing else, you know, you, you leave here thinking about how, assuming you think innovation is important, which is really the first decision, how do you craft a strategy and a strategy process through stewardship that will get things going, right? A lot of the specific um, initiatives and mechanics kind of fall out of that larger intention, which you have to get straight first. Um, innovation leadership is an art form, and I, you know, it could be the subject of an hour unto itself, but the only thing that I will say for the, since you're all leaders, you're all you know, in a senior position, is um, it's very important how you communicate and craft your message. So, um, um, you know, Sony, uh, the head of Sony came down to the engineers and said, I want somebody to be able to listen to music on their own, separated from an in-the-ground stereo system, and I want you to make it this big. And he left a block of wood on the table and it became the Sony Walkman. And that was all he said. Miles Davis, who's a very famous jazz leader, somebody asked him in an interview, well, you know, what's the secret to putting together great bands? And he said, it's real simple, and it's just four words. Don't say too much. The tendency for leaders is to say too much, right? 
Provide too many details. Fill in the blanks. Well, that gives no room for the creative team to actually do their work, right? So using metaphor, using broad directives, but being kind of uh, hands-off in a sense, allowing things to emerge is part of the, the craft of being a, an effective innovation leader. And then finally, I would say probably the most important but subtle skill is do you have a beginner's mind? Are you able to get to a place mindset-wise which is completely free of preconceptions so that you can allow new possibilities to, um, to emerge? Right? Um, the, the teacup here is from a famous uh, Zen Buddhist story about uh, someone who is uh, searching for enlightenment. And he came to see this uh, Zen uh, teacher and the guy looked at our hero and said, you know, you're not ready, go away, come back in 10 years. So our hero was very disappointed, but being a very compliant person, 10 years of the day he came back. Again, the teacher said, go away, no enlightenment for you, come back in 10 years. And this went on and on, till finally he came back for what he thought was the last time. And this time the teacher said, you're ready, come on in. Uh, what took you so long? You know, let's get started. And our hero can't believe his luck. So he walks into this beautiful temple back room, and the teacher says, hold out your teacup. Right? So holds out his teacup. The teacher pours tea into the cup, goes in the cup, up to the edge, keeps pouring, starts to spill out, keeps pouring, and tea goes all over the floor and makes a big mess in this room. And in that instant, our hero becomes enlightened. So you're not supposed to provide interpretations for these stories. You know, you're supposed to meditate about them for 10 years. But um, since we're short of time, I'll give you a little interpretation, which is, um, you know, the cup is our ability to understand things. It's our point of view. It's our uh, understanding. And uh, inside the cup is our knowledge, which is contained by our, you know, our, 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 our personality, our ego. And outside is everything else. And so at the moment of um, enlightenment, he saw that what was inside the cup and what was outside the cup were connected. They were really part of the same thing. That, you know, in some respects, getting to the beginner's mind, expanding the teacup, being able to look outside, was the beginning of generating knowledge that was truly valuable uh, because it would lead to something that was new. And the Zen Buddhists, in conclusion, have a saying, which is, uh, in the mind of the expert, you're all experts, right, in one way or another. The mind of the expert, there are many opinions. In the mind of the beginner, there are few opinions. And therefore, all new knowledge begins with beginner's mind. So anyway, I hope this has been of some value for you in your innovation journey, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have now. Thank you.